Hey everyone, Mr. O back with our next section of the Phantom Toll Booth. And like always, we'll review where we left off. So chapter six saw our main character Milo and his travel companion Tok still locked in the dungeon with the witch. And the witch told a story of the kingdom um, the kingdom of wisdom. And in that story, she talked about um, a nice benevolent king at first who founded the kingdom and then had two sons. And the two sons um, didn't get along too well. Um, they eventually were given the kingdom and they each went and founded their own cities. We had Dictionopolis with King Azaz, the unabridged. And then we had Digitopolis with Math Magician. And these two individuals, these two brothers, sadly, were just always trying to one-up the other. They were just trying to outdo and outshine. And um, <clears throat> they just, they found themselves in a lot of conflicts. And as this was going on, uh, the king found two, two young girls and he adopted them and brought them into his household and named them Rhyme and Reason. And if you remember, Rhyme and Reason were great listeners and they were even better at compromising. They would find, um, they would come to a conflict and they would find what one party wanted and what the other party wanted and they would bring them together and they would meet and they would come up with a compromise where both parties would be satisfied. That was a true gift that they had, not just for themselves, but for the whole kingdom. However, <clears throat> King Azaz and the math magician wound up in a huge conflict, the biggest of them all, so large that rhyme and reason um, weren't able to come up with a solution that satisfied the two brothers, and they banished them to the castle in the air, where they still remain, according to the witch. And that was the story. Um, and ever since then, both rhyme and reason have been missing from the entire kingdom, literally and figuratively. And then the witch showed Milo and Tok how to exit the, <clears throat> the jail or the dungeon, and that's where we pick back up. Chapter 7, The Royal Banquet. Right this way. Follow us. Come along. Step lively. Here we go. They shouted, hopping from the wagon and bounding up the broad marble staircase. Milo and Tok followed close behind. It was a strange-looking palace, and if he didn't know any better, Milo would have said it looked exactly like an enormous book, standing on end with its front door in the lower part of the binding, just where they usually place the publisher's name. Once inside, they hurried down a long hallway which glittered with crystal chandeliers and echoed with their footsteps. The walls and ceiling were covered with mirrors whose reflections danced dizzily along with them, and the footmen bowed coldly. We must be terribly late, gasped the Earl nervously as they reached the tall doors of the banquet hall. It was a vast, massive room, full of people loudly talking and arguing. The long table was carefully set with gold plates and linen napkins. An attendant stood behind each chair, and at the center, raised slightly above the others, was a throne covered in crimson cloth. Directly behind on the wall was the royal coat of arms, flanked by the flags of Dictionopolis. Milo noticed many of the people he had seen in the marketplace. The lettermen? Letterman was busy explaining to an interested group the history of the letter W. And off in a corner, the humbug and the spelling bee were arguing fiercely about nothing at all. Officer Shrift wandered through the crowd, suspiciously muttering, Guilty! Guilty! They're all guilty! And upon noticing Milo, he brightened visibly and commented in passing, Is it six million years already? My, how time flies. Everyone seemed quite grumpy, 
about having to wait for lunch, and they were all relieved to see the tardy guests arrive. Certainly glad you finally made it, old man, said the humbug, cordially pumping Milo's hand. As guest of honor, you must choose the menu, of course. Oh my, Milo thought, not knowing what to say. Be quick about it, suggested the spelling bee. I'm famished. F-A-M-I-S-H-E-D. As Milo tried to think, there was an ear-shattering blast of trumpets. Entirely off-key, Anna Page announced to the startled guests, King A-Z-A-Z, the unabridged. The king strode through the door and over to the table and settled his great bulk onto the throne, calling irritably, Places, everyone. Take your places. He was the largest man Milo had ever seen, with a great stomach, large, piercing eyes, a gray beard that reached to his waist, and a silver ring on the little finger of his left hand. He also wore a crown and a robe with the letters of the alphabet beautifully embroidered on it. What have we here? he said, staring down at Tok and Milo as everyone took their place. If you please, said Milo, my name is Milo, and this here is Tok. Thank you very much for inviting us to your banquet. I think your palace is beautiful. Exquisite, corrected the duke. Lovely, counseled the minister. Handsome, recommended the count. Pretty, hinted the earl. Charming, submitted the undersecretary. Silence, shouted the king. Now, young man, what can you do to entertain us? Sing songs? Tell stories? Compose sonnets? Juggle plates? Do tumbling tricks? Hmm. Come on, which is it? Um, I can't do any of those things, admitted Milo. What an ordinary little boy, commented the king. Why, my cabinet members can do all sorts of things. The duke here can make mountains out of molehills. The minister splits hairs. The count makes hay while the sun shines. The earl leaves no stone unturned. And the undersecretary, he finished ominously, hangs on by a thread. Can't you do anything at all? Uh, I can count to a thousand, offered Milo. Ah, numbers! Never mention numbers here. Only use them when we absolutely have to, growled AZAZ disgustedly. Now, why don't you and Tot come up here and sit next to me, and we'll have some dinner. Are you ready with the menu? reminded the humbug. Well, said Milo, remembering his mother had always told him to eat lightly when he was a guest. Well, why don't we have a light meal, said Milo. A light meal it shall be, roared the humbug, waving his arms. The waiters rushed in carrying large serving platters and set them on the table in front of the king. When he lifted the covers... Shafts of brilliant colored light leapt from the plates and bounced around the ceiling, the walls, across the floor, and out the windows. Not a very, uh, substantial meal, said the humbug, rubbing his eyes, but quite an attractive one. Perhaps you can suggest something a little bit more mm, filling. The king clapped his hands. The platters were removed, and without thinking, Milo quickly suggested, well, in that case... I think we ought to have a square meal of... A square meal it is! Shouted the humbug again. The king clapped his hands once more, and the waiters reappeared, carrying plates heaped high with steaming squares of all sizes and colors. Uh... Said the spelling bee tasting one. These are awful. No one seemed to like them very much either and the humbug got one caught in his throat and almost choked. Time for the speeches, 
announced the king, as the plates were again removed and everyone looked glum. You first, he commanded, pointing to Milo. Your majesty, ladies, gentlemen, started Milo timidly. I would like to take this opportunity to say that in all the... That's quite enough, snapped the king. Mustn't talk all day. But I'd, I'd only be just begun, objected Milo. Next, bellowed the king. Roast turkey, mashed potatoes, vanilla ice cream, recited the humbug, bouncing up and down quickly. What a strange speech, thought Milo, for he'd heard many speeches in the past, and they were supposed to be long and dull, he thought. Hamburgers, corn on the cob, chocolate pudding, P-U-D-D-I-N-G, said the spelling bee in his turn. Frankfurter sour pickle strawberry jam, shouted Officer Shrift from his chair. Since he was taller, sitting, than standing, he didn't bother to get up. And so down the line it went, with each guest rising briefly, making a short speech, and then resuming his place. When everyone had finished, the king rose. Pâté de foie gras, soupe à l'oignon, façon sous cliché, salade endive, fromage et fruit et demitasse, he said carefully, and clapped his hands once again. The waiters reappeared immediately, carrying heavy hot trays, which they set on the table. Each one contained the exact words spoken by the various guests, and they all began eating immediately with great gusto. Dig in, said the king, poking Milo with his elbow and looking disapprovingly at his plate. I can't say I think much of your choice. I didn't know that what that I was going to have to eat my words, objected Milo. Of course, of course, everyone does here, the king grunted. You should have made a tastier speech. Milo looked around at everyone, busily stuffing themselves, and then back at his own unappetizing plate. Certainly didn't look worth eating, and he was so very hungry. Here, try some uh, somersault, suggested the duke. It improves the flavor. Have a rigmarole, offered the count, passing the bread basket. Or a ragamuffin, seconded the minister. Perhaps you'd care for a synonym bun suggested the duke. Why don't you just wait for your desserts, mumbled the, mumbled the earl, his mouth full of food. How many times must I tell you not to bite off more than you can chew, snapped the undersecretary, panting, patting the distressed earl on the back. In one ear and out the other, scolded the duke, attempting to stuff one of his words through the earl's head. If it isn't one thing, it's another, chided the minister. Out of the frying pan and into the fire, shouted the Count, burning himself badly. Well, you don't have to bite my head off, screamed the terrified Earl, and flew at the others in a rage. The five of them scuffled wildly under the table. Stop that at once, shouted AZAZ, or I'll banish the lot of you. Sorry, excuse me, forgive us, pardon, regrets, they apologized in turn, and sat down glaring at each other. The rest of the meal was finished in silence until the king, wiping the gravy stains from his vest, called for dessert. Milo, who had not eaten anything, looked up eagerly. We're having a special treat today, said the king as the delicious smells of homemade pastries filled the banquet hall. By royal command, the pastry chefs have worked all night in the half bakery to make sure that... The half bakery? asked Milo. Why, of course, the half-bakery, snapped the king. Where do you think half-baked ideas come from? Now, please don't interrupt. By royal command, the pastry chefs have worked all night, too. What's a half-baked idea? Asked Milo again. Will you be quiet? Growled AZAZ angrily. But before he could begin again, three large serving carts were wheeled into the hall, and everyone jumped up to help themselves. They're very tasty, explained the humbug, but they don't always agree with you. Here's one that's very good. He handed it to Milo, and through the icing and nuts, Milo saw that it said, The earth is flat. 
People swallowed that one for years, commented the spelling bee, but it's not very pop. Excuse me. But it's not very popular these days. D-A-Y-S. He picked up a long one that stated, the moon is made of green cheese, and hungrily bit off the part that said cheese. Now there's a half-baked idea, the spelling bee said, smiling. Milo looked at the great assortment of cakes, which were being eaten almost as quickly as anyone could read them. The count was munching contentedly on, it never rains, but it pours. And the king was busy slicing one that stated, night air is bad air. I wouldn't eat too many of those if I were you, advised, <clears throat> advised to talk. They may look good, but you could get terribly sick. Don't worry, Milo replied. I'll just wrap one up for later. And he folded his napkin around. Everything happens for the best. That's the end of chapter seven. The Royal Banquet. Now, here we are back in Dictionopolis where there are so many fun ways that language is being used. Um, my favorite is all of our, my favorite are all of the idioms that are used in this chapter. Now an idiom is a figurative part of speech. It's language that's used not literally. So for example, if I said, Oh, you hit the nail right on the head. That doesn't actually mean you took a hammer and hit a nail directly on the head of the nail. Instead, it actually means, like, you're very right. Now, if you took the words literally with what they actually mean, you would instead think hammer, nail, But an idiom takes that language and it means something slightly different or figurative. Um, and it was kind of funny because I don't think all of the guests of the Royal Banquet realized they were using idioms figuratively. I think they might have been taking them rather literally. So for this activity, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to type up a number of kind of fun idioms. Um, and I'm going to put them into a document and then I would love if you would draw a picture of what the literal picture of those words might mean. So if I had hit the nail on the head, you might draw a hand and a hammer and a little nail with that round flat head. That would be its literal image of the words. But that's not really what that phrase means. So now the challenge and the fun part would be to figure out what it actually means and then to try to depict its actual idiomatic meaning in a picture. So for you hit the nail right on the head, we know that that means you are very right. So maybe I would draw a picture of two individuals having a conversation and I would use the conversation bubbles that come out of their mouths and I could write a little conversation back and forth. Maybe it has multiple little squares similar to a comic strip. And they could have a conversation about, um, oh, they could have a conversation about anything that ends with, you hit the nail right on the head. Um, maybe you come up with something else. I'm sure your creativity is stronger than mine. And um, I'm really trying not to edit these videos because it takes a lot longer. So I'm trying to take it in one take. So I will put that idiom work together. Um, <clears throat> it's a fun little matching card activity. Um, and I will include that in the activities folder for you. But in the meantime, happy listening. And I am going to take a break from recording these over the weekend so that I have a little bit of time to spend doing things that I like um, and spend some time with my, my girlfriend. Right now she thinks all I'm doing is working. And um, I want to give her some time. Um, because I miss her, and I think that's the fair thing to do. So, happy weekend. I look forward to you continuing to uh, do these activities, and I look forward to you getting more of the presentations that I've been recording all week, similar to the solar system. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>